Welcome to Online Offscript, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Mir McNitt, the social media director. And I'm Sam Olmsted, the New Orleans managing director. This month is actually our company Online Optimism's 10th anniversary. So we thought who better to talk about the last 10 years of internet marketing than our CEO, Flynn Zager. Also, we're hoping that having him on as a guest will play positively in our annual reviews. Thanks for joining us, Flynn. How are you? I'm doing great. How about yourselves? Oh, doing we're good. doing great, too. Um, all right. Well, let's just get into it. What made you want to start Online Optimism? Yeah, so I had a job out of college that um, I think right now we would call it wasn't the, the right fit. I was maybe nine, 10 years ahead of the great resignation. Uh, and I looked for other positions. And to be frank, no one really hired me. I also have done digital marketing since I was a precocious teenager, helping my parents sell on uh, the new site back then, which was eBay and then Amazon, Yahoo Web Stores. And I've I've kind of seen all of these e-commerce platforms grow. And I had a couple uh, internships in college that offered to hire me. And I figured if they're going to hire me as an employee, they seem to be open to hiring me if I had my own company. And uh, they don't really warn you when you're going to start a company. No one stops you. I think that would be a great program if before every entrepreneur began, someone was like, are you sure? Would you, do you really want to do this? Have you actually thought this through? But no one did that. On a $75 check to the Louisiana Secretary of State later, uh, I had an LLC and started building this website. Wow. I'm really glad that you took the initiative to start the business because I don't want to start a business. Uh, <laughs> everyone's always like, why don't you go out on your own? I'm like, no, I see how much work it takes, Flynn. I don't want to do that yeah, part. I I often get asked, you know, like, what's your best advice? And it's really, it's really short advice. It's uh, don't do it. <laughs> find, a, find a job with benefits and a paycheck where you could uh, be pretty happy. Um, but I, I think if you very much want to make your own thing and you want that complete control, uh, I say as now that I think about it, you know, being a CEO, you're very, very little in control because your employees and customers and clients kind of dictate your every day. But it's still a little bit more control than you might have in other positions. So it's probably really the, the main benefit of actually running your own company. All right. I have a hard hitting question. How did you pick the name Online Optimism? Online Optimism, uh, like all good company names, was inspired by SEO and trying to rank high on Google. Um, I wanted a company name with online or internet or digital in it. Um, I also am a terrible writer. Thank heavens that we have copywriters on staff now. So I love alliteration and rhyming. If there's anything on our website um, that rhymes, it was likely invented by me. Like donate elevates is one of our policies. I'm pretty sure that that's my blame. Uh, and so <laughs> I put together a list of a lot of internet words and then a lot of more positive words. Um, I'm actually not the most optimistic person, although uh, you both gave me very clear directions before this podcast recording to be more optimistic on it. So hopefully I'm sounding great so far. Uh, and I, I figured that if we kind of, I, I like the idea that this company is both making me a happier person and making our clients a happier person. So we went through things like digital delight and, and other weird combinations and online optimism. Uh, really kind of hit the guidelines of it was two words, relatively easy to spell, although I've learned in the last decade that optimism is not that easy to spell. Um, and back then it was had the super important criteria of under 15 characters, so it could be a Twitter handle. Digital Delight like... sounds like a great dessert. <laughs> yeah, it sounds well, like it's like $75. A... Yeah. The new That's Crumble. It's like Crumble Cookies, NFTs, Digital Delights. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. Okay, so you did touch on the fact that you do not consider yourself an optimist, really. But what makes a capital O optimist? I think it's uh, people that are passionate about helping others and also passionate about the internet with like some caution. Uh, I think a good example is honestly, you two are some of our, our better examples of what we think of when we think of online optimism. When people talk about our culture, um, I usually tell them the best way to learn about our culture is to talk to anyone else on our team other than myself. Um, Cause we really try to hire people that fit this more like bright, positive personality. I also think it's extremely knowledgeable about the internet. I know that anyone under the age of 40 or even many people older than 40 now are very, very passionate about online communities. But I think that what our optimists have is a certain skill set and desire to kind of know the inner workings 
behind how these sorts of forums or feeds or whatever the next big thing is actually work. You know, understanding how engagement changes things, understanding how memes spread. Uh, and while we, you know, might not do that every day in our workplace, I think it gives us that kind of background understanding so that when an optimist is, you know, talking about why a post is doing well or isn't doing well or why an advertisement is being targeted a certain way they could communicate it in a positive simplistic manner but also actually know behind the scenes what's going on yeah i totally agree and i think that one of the things that i see in other optimists is um this ability to go to a deeper layer of the internet um where it's not just a passive consumer of information but someone who's kind of contributing to it as well so I think that's kind of another aspect of, of being an optimist. Um, so I completely agree with you there. Speaking of that, what internal efforts have you made in the last 10 years? Because I know I'm optimism has been around for 10 years now um, to keep up with the various marketing trends. And um, do you join every social platform? Do you have a be real? Let's talk about it. <laughs> so I, I will say the, the best way that I can learn from people is to in, to grow a business is to talk to other business owners. Um, so I know this is kind of a terrible thing, thing to say on a for an internet company on a internet podcast, but uh, the best way I learn is face to face communication. So I, I do try to find organizations that will collaborate and bring that together. So it's a lot of, you know, old school, traditional business organizations, small business stuff. Uh, it's one of the reasons that we send a lot of our staff to conferences. I think every director on our team went to a conference this year, because I, I really feel that those sorts of in-person communities are some of the best ways to learn. That being said, obviously, we're not in person every day. Um, so Twitter has always been a great one. Endlessly following people on Twitter gives me a absolutely embarrassing follower following ratio. I'm so sorry to our team who has to show that off occasionally. Um, but I just love following new accounts and learning from them. And then over the years, it's turned into what seems to be the cool thing now of Discord and Slacks, where people are kind of sharing ideas and having these more collaborative conversations. There's some LinkedIn as well, uh, just to see what posts are coming up and, and who's talking. That's been a little interesting to see, particularly in COVID, as that engagement in community has kind of grown. Although I think what we've also been seeing on those more social platforms rather than like the chat room based platforms is that they get to be gamed a lot. Um, it's why everyone's Twitter is now just tweet threads uh, with seven lessons hidden behind a, a reply wall, um, which is the bane of my existence. And I I endlessly try to curate my feed to prevent those from happening by saying, I don't want to see this anymore, Twitter. Twitter does not care. They know I want to see that. Um, and, and even on LinkedIn, it's these weird like morality lessons and long tails that are now appearing number one. So I, I think why I've been gravitating towards things like Slack and Discords in the marketing community is that they haven't been, you know, there's no SEO for Slack yet. Sure, one day there will be. That's that's if, if there's an audience and there's eyes, someone like our team will figure out a way to get more eyes onto it. Uh, but until SEO agencies ruin that platform, I'm I'm excited to use it. I mean, SEO is now on just... TikTok, so yes, we have ruined <laughs> captions, uh, and yeah, that's actually kind of. I was seeing articles that was about how people are really nervous because. Uh, there's false information on TikTok, like everywhere else on the internet was totally fine. No false information. Everything Google showed should be number one, uh, completely ignoring the last 25 years of our industry. Um, I, I think it's, I think there's a lot of fears around TikTok as a platform that uh, I feel are, are just as scary if you deep dive into any of the other, other platforms, but I am probably swayed by their algorithm just being so, so terrifyingly uh, addictive. Listen, not to get us completely off topic here, but every complaint that anyone has ever made about a singular social media platform, I've been like, that is all of the rest social media platforms. And this thing that you com are complaining about is actually the exact reason why you like it. So yeah. like, it's like people who hate sugar, but only eat donuts. Like, oh, 
the the reason that Twitter is showing me those those darn threads is because I keep clicking. I'm like, oh, I wonder what the lesson is in this one. And so I, and then I just talk about how much I hate it, but I click, and the algorithm knows me better than I know myself. Uh, something that I'm actually suffering through right now is that I hate TikTok lives and TikTok is absolutely moving into a sphere of loving lives. Um, I know that we talked about that recently internally, um, but because I hate them so much, I refuse to engage with them. So now I get these like really weird lives that it's trying to get me to watch um, like weird, like medical images or like this guy like peeling an eggshell off of an egg i got that one too you get the egg one yeah um M- mine is egg ones and lottery scratchers which is definitely oh. a bad sign for my <laughs> for, for whatever it thinks i'm interested in. i think it knows yeah. i make bad bets and that's what it, it's trying to get me looped in on it says you need money and protein and that's what that's what it's <laughs> trying to push on you <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so like part of the problem is if you don't let the algorithms know what you do like, it's going to try to figure out for itself. And you're going to see some really scary stuff. I've seen things that I'm like, oh, that's going to give me nightmares. Uh, so now just whenever yeah. a nice little a nice little ASMR artist pops up as my live, I'll watch it for a little bit just so they keep sending me those. Because there's nothing scary about someone tapping on their microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Yet. Yeah, you know, it, Black Mirror, anything can happen. Um <laughs> All right, I'll move us on to the next question. So, I mean, like, obviously, like, 2020 was a year of reckoning in a lot of uh, reasons. Um, But obviously, like, racial inclusiveness was a big one. And a lot of companies use their marketing to show that they are going to be different. Um, And, you know, I talk about this with people outside of marketing that no matter what you do inside, as long as you can convince the world that you're doing it, with your marketing, you'll get away with it. Um, But with the industry, how do you think that online online optimism and the marketing industry as a whole have actually done the work to be more inclusive? Yeah, I think obviously 2020 was a, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous thing to be like, oh, it was great that we paid attention when, you know, you kind of had about 400 years to pay attention to the to the issues behind the scenes and I, I think what was most interesting to see come out of it was how this is a at the forefront of leadership's mind even in the many many cases now where these conversations aren't happening anymore where the company did a blackout tuesday post in 2020 made some donations uh in july august 2020 kind of wrapped up the year and made a nice little statement and they haven't done anything since. From what I've talked to with other business owners, um, those thoughts are still in people's heads, although I will very much uh, uh, agree that action has slowed down. Um, and sometimes those thoughts are, oh, thank, thank heaven those conversations are over, which is the, kind of the most ridiculous thing. And I, I talk about this a lot when talking to other CEOs is that it's really, really hard for us to understand what is a worthwhile piece of training for our staff and team. Like, and we talk about this all the time with video and social platforms, like, is it, is it useful to, for us to make an investment into say TikTok? Like, is it going to be around in 10 years? Who knows? But you know what is going to be around in 10 years? DEI and conversations around race and gender, because they've been around for hundreds of years in America and around the world. So that's like, if you want a safe investment into something that you know your team is going to need skills and, and language around for the next decade, there was no, and this is a terrible, I, 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 it's terrible, but it's going to be conversations about this. These, these subjects are going to come up. This is not going to be fixed in America in the next decade. And so it's worth thinking about it. And people are thinking about it. I'd love to see more action. I'd love to see more organizations being held accountable um, y'all are have heard me even say in meetings like, and it's on me. Like we are, we could be doing more, and we should be doing more. Um, and it's things that we still try to do in different programs that we have, but it, it's challenging. And to be frank, there's like less of an impetus when other organizations aren't doing things either. You know, in 2020, we had to do something because everyone was doing something, and then 2021, we did something because our staff insisted, and I thought it was really important. And in 2022, we're still rolling out programs. And we're still doing nonprofits and it's like a lot of work that we're doing, but, but I, I do in the back of my mind, it's always like, you know, if this conversation was happening, it is a national discourse more often, 
we would be doing more. And is it wrong for us not to be doing more? Which, yeah, it is. And it's something that we need to think about how we prioritize as an agency. Um, and and I, I will also say, I think one of the bright spots is that employees are demanding this more. And I, I don't want to say that this is just an age thing where younger people are are looking for more diverse companies. There are stats and numbers that show that, but I've met many, many older individuals and people all around the country in all different states that have this as a priority. So I don't think it's as that simple, but it does seem to be coming up in conversations with people looking to join organizations and companies where their mission and values reflects the diversity that people actually talked about in 2020. And what's nice is that they now have two years to look back at the company and to sit down in an interview. And when they go, do you have any questions for us? To say, yeah, what have you done in two years around DEI and race and gender in your organization? And how are you actually expressing that in 2022? As opposed to, you know, what social media post did you do two years ago and then forget about? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I feel like I see on TikTok people all the time being like, what should you ask in an interview? And people should ask, absolutely be doing, be like, oh, I looked through and saw that you made a statement after Memorial Day in 2020. What have you done? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's interview. It, it's interesting in interviews, and we often because we do so much uh, interview training with like our specialists who are our paid interns about like in interviews. And this is a little bit away from the DEI question, but like this is a two way street. And you're if you're trying to get a job, great. Like think about these questions. But sometimes it's like a are you trying to get a job? Or are you trying to find an organization that you actually want to work for? Um, and people are at different stages of their life. People will want, you know, some people just want a paycheck and some people want some place where they could build a career. Um, but yeah, if you want a place that actually reflects your values, you should be asking about those values in those interviews, because as you were saying, Mira, super easy to market and promote ourselves as doing all sorts of DEI stuff and initiative and to make sure that we have diverse stock photos and images and all that. Um, but actually asking someone name a single initiative your organization's done this year around DEI, it's been nine months, you should have had something, um, will actually give you an answer as opposed to is, you know, <laughs> is there social media intern just posting uh, DEI stuff without actually telling management? I am so sorry that I said that it was an intern. I was say, not I was an like, employee doing social media, Mira. I know. It's not the intern, it's the director. <laughs> it's because this was a bad company who we don't want to steal policies from. And that's why they had an intern doing it. Of course, that explains it all. All right, Sam, you got another question for us? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Maria. So, Flynn, what do you think there's, you know, one area of marketing that companies should stop focusing on? As in, you know, it could be a, um, a sector of marketing, whether it's um, part of paid advertising, organic social media, or organic um, content creation. Um, is there anything that you think that is falling out of fashion um, as we move into the next 10 years of online optimism? Yeah, I think it's honestly any any short-term strategy. And I realize that that's like, if you're a business owner and you're listening, you're like, of course the marketing agency doesn't want to be judged on their first 30 days of performance. <laughs> like that's that's the easiest way to get out of, our, of proving your results. And, and I understand the frustration. I just feel like at this point in the internet's evolution, any short-term win, unless you're in a industry that is uh, <laughs> is centered around weird schemes, like you're in crypto or NFTs or any of that. Like, But if you were like a, a small business or you're, you're B2B or even B2C, like anything that you do that, that works quickly will be immediately duplicated by a competitor who ha probably has more resources and more time and has staff ready to do it. So like you, you just have to forget about get rich quick schemes. And I, I don't mean just making, I mean like getting to the top of Google or doing something on social media that just works well once. And I think the, it goes back to the same thing that marketers have been telling people for 30 years and that we never listen to is that whole content is king is that you have to be telling good long stories and you have to be actually building on values and, and, and storytelling and kind of the, the culture of your organization. I, I think that's what we, are seeing people, if I can slightly switch your conversation to what do you need to be focusing on is a lot more of the people and the the, the mission behind the business. Uh, what has been fascinating is to see that all of these 
brands that used to be, and I think kind of, and I will do the cliche thing of bringing up uh, Wendy's Twitter and Duel and Go TikTok, which I think now has been talked about on about half of these podcast episodes. But I think it's important that, you know, Wendy's Twitter years when it started up was run by like a team of like New York comedians, but we never knew who they were. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we know the Duolingo owl. Although I will say, I definitely think she has an intern in the mascot outfit. I don't think she's wearing that mascot outfit that often anymore. Um, and, and we know who it is and she's getting recognition. And, and I think that's been fascinating to see is treating businesses less as businesses and treating them as the people behind the, the organization. Um, and I think that's been, it's honestly a little challenging for us as an agency, right? Cause we're an outside partner and we're, I'm saying that people value the companies and the employees behind it. But I think that's our job as to how do we tell this business's story and talk about the people there. I actually saw a really interesting podcast clip the other day. Sorry, I don't remember the name of the podcast, but they are basically saying that we've just moved on to real life mascots. Like we used to have Tony the Tiger and uh, Ronald McDonald and like all these different characters, the, uh, the Kool-Aid man that like told us why a product was great and we loved them. And now it's the exact same thing, but it's just someone within the company. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, and there's always been like celebrity endorsements is that these are just no longer celebrities. These are just people who can write really good content. Uh, I think what's interesting is going to be seeing how they evolve and like their loyalty. I mean, mm -hmm. to use a very millennial example, right? You had the, uh, can you hear me now guy from one of the phone companies, I guess it's a bad sign for the advertisement. I can't name the phone company, but then he like switched years later to the other company. And will we see that with creators? Like are are you going to steal a creator from a competitor and have them do your content instead of theirs? Like, because you think that they'll carry the audience over. And I don't think that's something we've seen in the influencer campaigns yet, but there's been a lot more of giving bigger creators, like, like Mr. Beast and all them platform incentives to stick on one. And we see that more in the live streaming sphere, which um, is, is a whole other world. But I think that's what we're going to see over time is giving more, Will creators actually have power for once or will capitalism win over and figure out a way to take all of their earnings? I feel like that really depends. Like, I feel like Dave from the Washington Post could change news, like news organizations and like, it doesn't matter. Like he's still Dave, but the girl who does a Duolingo owl, like that humor is like so niche and so recognized as like Duolingo's account that like, no matter where she takes it to, like people will still be like, oh, that's. If, if they don't know it's her, they're like, oh, they're just trying to be Duolingo. Yeah. Well, I think, and, and that's also the thing is with like these companies where we can name like what their style is, like, will they eventually like rebrand their personality? And I think it's like really important to realize that all the digital stuff we do is so new in the world of marketing that like really there's very few accounts or platforms that have been around for 10 years, which is wild. You're dealing with brands that have been around for 50 100 years like the washington post like and how if that if that brand has stayed the same will there or like when the brands like rebrand and they have like new values and new mission will the social media platforms follow or like for example you know right now like everyone's twitter is just the same snark in mm -hmm. just varying degrees of disgust depending on who uh what, what kind of industry it is and and uh, i'm curious to see how that evolves I think the only brand who had a pre-internet era or like early internet era voice brand that is carried well is Progressive and Mayhem. Like yeah. he he has lasted. Yeah, um, that might be it. All right, next question. Now the short form video is taking over. Have you found it difficult to adapt to the less produced style of content? I love and hate the less produced style of content. Uh, I think it was always fascinating because when we were, when we first started doing like and selling video at Online Optimism, we would be like compared to TV production. And they'd be like, oh, these are internet videos. And now you get like TV production videos that are just like so, like very low budget things that are trying to emulate TikToks. And, and what's also weird is we're seeing the, the, so basically everyone's trying to be the other side where now you get like TikToks and these, the creators are incredible at some of the editing that they do. Um, and they're trying to produce 
highly, highly produced content. Um, I think as an agency, it's the same thing we've always had, right? Try to create a story that actually fits the medium where it's being presented uh, and making something authentic. I think it's good for agencies. I think, you know, just because things are low budget doesn't mean they're easy. Uh, although, of course, when I do talks, I'm like, yes, anyone can film it. And it's true. Like, you literally, anyone could go live on TikTok and answer questions and talk about their job. And I think those are some of the more fascinating things, particularly if you have a weird job that, like, no one's ever heard of or it's just, like, something that you think you know, like librarians. I don't know what librarians do anytime. Like they all seem to have great TikTok accounts, which is like, what were they doing before TikTok? No clue. But I would love to watch a TikTok live and learn about what they're doing. So I think that's been interesting. Uh, I think the challenge is going to be for organizations like us is how do you show that value to a company? Like, yeah, it was really easy to show value of a video that required a $10,000 prop budget. But what's the value of... A, a content creator doing a, you know, a, a 50 cuts in three seconds <laughs> on a really weird TikTok edit that is just about brand awareness and it's about growing the account. And there's just some blind trust that this will, this will help grow the organization over time. So that's kind of on us to, to prove the value of. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So one of the reasons why we're doing this podcast is because it's been 10 years since you started online optimism. So first of all, congratulations. Um, and second of <laughs> all, <laughs> second of all, what's next? This is an open-ended question. What's next for online optimism? Yeah, I, I think that the first 10 years of running a business is, uh, and I, I, I guess I, I hope that Jordan, who's edited this, doesn't edit out the gulp and the deep pause, even though this question was like, we're, like, we're going to ask you what's next, Flynn. You should prepare an answer. And I was like, oh, I don't think I can prepare an answer. Um, I think when we think about what our organization represents, it's helping our clients and our staff. So that's really what's been kind of at the forefront of my mind as I think about what do we, what the heck do we do in the second decade of a business is now that we have a team, we have equipment, we have offices, we have remote work policies, um, we've survived and have so much knowledge. Um, I, I really want to kind of build this out to be more, and not that it wasn't long term, like I think, you know, it's one of the, the first things that people tend to say to us is just how organized for what's still a vaguely young company we are and how efficient, but I, I really want to bring it to the next level in, in building out bigger career paths. And, and I also want to make sure that we're competitive nationally with our, our benefits and our services to clients. Um, we've really been talking to our team about making sure that they're always testing things, always being on new platforms, always trying to be on leading trends, like accepting that, you know, if I listen to this podcast two years after it airs, whatever's going to be the coolest network is definitely not something we're talking about today. Like it's going to be something weird. It's going to be like, yes, six second videos are back. Everyone's super excited for them. Uh, maybe we'll like get rid of audio. I think that's kind of my weird thing is now that like everything's captioning um, and TikTok's obviously brought like audio memes back, but I feel like there's just going to be, um, I don't know, there's like accessibility stuff that I think is going to come into play, which is me getting sidetracked. So that's to say there's a lot of ideas for the next 10 years of online optimism um, but I really think it's going to be about hopefully guiding our clients to whatever's next. Probably weird SEO stuff on TikTok, a lot more video, a lot, a lot more video. I know everyone's been saying that for 10 years. I know even in 10 years from now, I'll be like, oh, there's going to be more video. Um, I think the streaming platforms in, as Netflix adds on more ads and YouTube is continuously increasing ads. I think Disney has a new ad platform plus that's going to be coming up. Uh, Apple is likely to roll out a new search network, which is really something I'm excited about. Um, mostly because one of the things that I, we didn't get to do in our first 10 years is really like be at the forefront necessarily of some of these bigger platforms getting ready to be on them when they launch. And I'm like, yeah, like Apple doesn't have an ad platform. They have like ad platform at the moment, but it hasn't really been rolled out and they've been bringing in more and more staff. Um, and that's been I think one of my like favorite things as a CEO when I have time is like look at what these platforms are hiring for and see, okay, how do we, before this platform has built out this product, 
how do we capitalize on that? Um, so yeah, I guess long story short, probably video, something weird with TikTok, Apple, and uh, yeah, hopefully uh, happier employees. Not that you both aren't happy, but even happier. I'd like More to make a prediction. Please. I, I think that Netflix, sometime in this next 10 years, Netflix is going to try having like live streaming channels. That's my prediction. Yeah. Watch it. <laughs> What's been fascinating is how many platforms add on live streaming. And they get to the same issue that Clubhouse got to. And nothing, nothing I love doing more than bringing up blog posts I read 15 years ago and trying to, or 15 months ago and pretending I'm an expert in this thing I read way, way ago. But the issue with live streaming is that the content is rarely as entertaining as pre film content. Because you, you don't have, and that was like the trouble with Clubhouse is if you turn it on, I, I I should give the caveat. I haven't turned on the app in twelve months, so if they are, <laughs> if they have fixed this, let me know. Put it, uh, send it over to our podcast uh, communications. Um, but you need something constantly entertaining, and you and you expressed this with TikTok earlier, right? You're you're getting someone peeling an egg, which. I don't know if you've ever actually watched it. It's kind of fascinating for a little it's bit. It's weird. It, <laughs> you're like, they're going to pop it. And they're just stuck there <laughs> waiting for it to pop. Yeah. But like, how do you create endless, endless content? And even the, the TV networks couldn't do it, right? You had yeah. infomercials from midnight to 6 a.m. as someone who's always been an insomniac. Like, they make a lot of money selling those products. <laughs> Sam's a buyer. And we see I'm a buyer. And you do see that in, in Asia has been a lot more of um, live e-commerce and Instagram was yeah. dabbling with this, but it seems that a lot of the North American, every time they try this, because there's so much money coming out of this in Asia, that all these platforms are attempting to duplicate it in North America. And I, I honestly don't understand why, how, why it hasn't worked because like QVC and all them, like there's people want to buy, but for some reason they hasn't made the plunge to like, people wanting to watch influencers talk about content and then buy that product. And there, there's definitely some examples and there's definitely some. I think they did that for prime day this year. Yeah. So they're trying it and, and like yeah. there's been more and more, but it hasn't hit mainstream. And at this point, I don't think it's going to hit mainstream because like you said, prime day did it. And we're not talking about that anymore. Like yeah. I don't see anyone, any part of like the main internet culture, which I guess is now basically TikTok videos being shared on Twitter, um, are not doing that sort of communication. So I think it's an opportunity, but we'll see. We'll see. I thought your prediction was going to be that Netflix was going to die in the next 10 years. And I was like, wow, brave mirror. No, but I will say that. <laughs> was that Tom? I will say that five years ago when I interviewed to be an intern here at Online Optimism, um, one of the questions I was asked is, what do you think is going to be the biggest social media platform in five years? And I said, I don't think it exists yet. And we are, here we are with TikTok taking over. Um, I'm pretty sure that Musical.ly, which was the forerunner of TikTok or whatever, I don't know what it, the actual... Musical.ly uh, was the pre-TikTok, but it was not what TikTok is. It was just lip syncing. There was no original true. content. And that was wild to like look at that and go, yeah, that platform, the weird karaoke app is totally <laughs> going to take over and dominate the entire American culture in five years. Um, but yeah, you never, never know what things could pivot into. Like our federal government is going to be having meetings discussing this app where kids dance. <laughs> <laughs> totally. All right. We'll be fine. Well, that wraps up our time. Uh, Flynn, thank you so much for joining us. If people want to talk to you, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, I am on Twitter. Please follow me. So my follower uh, following ratio gets slightly less pathetic. I'm at Flynn Zager, F-L-Y-N-N, Z as in zebra, A-I-G-E-R. You could also email me, Flynn at onlineoptimism.com. I'm not going to spell that out because I have the catch-all email address. So if you email anything at onlineoptimism.com and it doesn't go to another human being, it will go to my inbox. So feel free to put whatever fun typos you want on that email address. Well, I'm going to start doing that. All right. Please. <laughs> All right, Flynn, we're going to do our outro. So thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you. See you all on thanks, Slack. Thanks, Flynn. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or on LinkedIn. 
And as always, stay optimistic.